The YouTube live streaming console has tons of knobs and buttons. There are so many options here and it's not always obvious what they're all for. In this video, I'm gonna show you every single option in the YouTube live streaming console so that you can make better live streams. Hi, I'm Aaron Parecki. So let's start by first figuring out how we even get into the console in the first place. When you're in your normal YouTube dashboard, there's a button here, go live, or you can click on the top right corner under create. Click on this go live button and that drops you into the YouTube live streaming console. There's a couple things I'm gonna point out really quickly here before we jump into the details. You might notice on the left side, there's these three different options, streaming, webcam, and manage. Mostly I work in the manage tab, but you can also use the stream tab or webcam as well. We're gonna focus on the manage tab and we'll come back to the stream and webcam at the end. The reason that you'll probably wanna use the manage tab over everything else is that this is what lets you schedule a live stream in advance so that you can get a link ahead of time so you can send it to people. So let's get started by clicking the schedule stream button in the top right corner. This will first give you an option to either reuse settings from a previous live stream or create a new live stream. Clicking the reuse settings button will copy over the title, description, and thumbnail, and a bunch of the other settings that we're gonna look into in a second. But I'm gonna go ahead and click create new so we can start from scratch. This screen looks similar to uploading a video. It's where you set your details, your title, description, as well as putting it into a playlist and a thumbnail. And then you've got your monetization and a couple other settings up here as well. So let's first just go ahead and type in the title. Give it a quick description. This next option is really important. How do you want to go live? I'm gonna choose the streaming software option because that's what lets me push video to YouTube from a streaming encoder like the ATEM Mini. The webcam and mobile options will let you live stream from either the built-in webcam on your laptop or computer or a mobile phone. And this is just letting us schedule it live ahead of time. But I'm gonna go ahead and just choose streaming software. Just like videos, you can put your live streams into a category and you can also add a thumbnail. You can also put your live stream into a playlist. And this is actually really important. I have a playlist here called Weekly Live Streams. One of the weird things about playlists is that if you make your video unlisted, but it's in a playlist, it will still show up in that playlist, which means it's not really unlisted anymore. So if someone navigates to that playlist, they can find your unlisted live stream. So if you do put it in a playlist and you're not ready to actually have it show up on your channel yet, just make sure you eventually choose the private option. Okay, we've also got the audience and also the paid promotion tags, and these are just, just like a regular video. I'm gonna pop over to the monetization tab. I'm gonna choose monetization on. If your channel is monetized, you can choose to monetize your live streams as well, of course. And one of the things I like to do here is actually turn off the non-skippable video ads. And the reason for that is because if you imagine you're in a live stream, someone clicks a link to your live stream and they start watching, and then they get a non-skippable ad. They have to watch the whole ad. That means they're missing whatever's happening during your stream. So I like to turn that off. That way people, when they jump in for the first time, they're not gonna get interrupted with a unskippable ad. I do leave the skippable ads turned on just so that I do get monetized. That will let them skip it after a couple of seconds so they don't miss much. This option down here is new, automatically place mid-roll ads during your stream. This is relatively new and it will kind of insert ads randomly throughout the stream and it'll be different for every viewer. So it's not like you can choose where to put the ad break. Let's go ahead and click on next. The customization tab has a couple of features that are unique to live streams that are not in regular videos. This is where you can choose whether you want live chat and live chat replay turned on. Live chat is of course, letting your viewers chat in the box live next to the stream. If you don't turn that on, there will be no chat available at all. And it's more of just like a broadcast then. I always turn this on because of course, I want my viewers to be able to chat with me during live streams. Live chat replay is really important as well because I like having the chat next to the video when people watch the replay. That helps them feel like they're more involved in the video even if they're watching it the next day. The next option is participant modes and this is really important. The option anyone means literally anybody even if they're not subscribed to your channel will be able to chat in your live stream. That's nice for getting new viewers and it's nice to be able to grow a community that way. The problem is that there is definitely a spam problem on YouTube and I have had a number of occasions where people come by, drop something really horrible in the chat, or their username is set to something really horrible and they just say hi. And then you have to deal with that and it's just not fun for anybody. So lately what I've been doing is I've been using the subscribers option, which means that only subscribers to your channel can chat. Now you can choose how long somebody has to have been a subscriber and you can choose the defaults or even your own custom. I found that a one minute delay is actually enough to turn away most spammers. 
Basically what it means is that if they're not subscribed and they land on your live stream because it got surfaced to them in their, in their YouTube console, then they have to click subscribe and then wait a minute before they can chat. And that's just enough of a deterrent to keep them away. However, it's not gonna keep everybody away. And depending on what you're talking about or who your channel is, you may find that some spammers are willing to wait out the minute. So you might have to experiment with going up to five. And I actually had to do this recently because I've started to get a couple more spam than I would like even at one minute. So I usually leave mine at five now. Now the live commentary option is like a whole totally different way of doing live chat. Basically it means that only select people that you choose are able to chat. So it's more like a broadcast. If you're running a webinar then you and you want only your staff to be able to chat and say things in the chat, not to talk to each other, but to talk about what's going on, that's a great way to do that. And basically only approved users can actually say things in the chat and nobody else will be able to. Live reactions is also relatively new. This is a way for people to send in kind of like emojis into this into the stream that don't show up in the chat. I haven't actually seen it on my streams yet, so I don't know exactly what it looks like. There was some other page on YouTube that talked about what that is. It's still relatively new. I think they're doing a slow rollout of it, so you may or may not have this feature right now. Message delay is useful if, again, you have a very popular live stream and you want to kind of throttle back the chat a bit. You can actually say that, okay, people have to wait 60 seconds between messages they send. It'll show people that slow mode is on during the stream, so they'll be able to see that in the chat window, and they'll know that they have to wait 60 seconds between messages. I don't have that turned on because my chat is usually not so overwhelming that I can't follow it along with the 100 people who are there. Okay, the redirect feature, this is pretty fun. This will actually let you chain live streams together and it doesn't have to be only on your own channel. This is a great way to take your audience and then drop them into somebody else's stream after yours ends. Stream day was a fun event we did last year across several different channels. There was John, Photo Joseph, Doug, Petra, David, John again, Ryan, and myself, and then a panel at the end. And the way this works is that all these videos are on our individual channels. But what happened is if you started here, when that stream ended, it would then automatically redirect the viewers to the next one. And we created this whole day long chain of streams where you just had to start at the beginning or jump in in the middle and you would just get redirected automatically to the next ones. So when you click this, it's gonna ask you either to find one of your own videos or to choose videos from other channels. This is all the channels that I follow, that I subscribe to, who have a setting turned on that allow me or anybody to redirect to their streams. You can actually turn that off if you don't want people to be able to redirect to your streams. I like having it on because it's kind of fun. So these are the channels that I can choose to redirect my viewers to when my stream ends. The trailer feature is also really useful. This is basically a way to have a video play before your live stream starts when someone lands on the page. Without the trailer feature, if someone clicks on your next scheduled live stream, they just see the thumbnail for the stream. With the trailer feature turned on, this will actually start playing a video right away. And it can be like a short 15, 30 second video intro to the stream, talking about what the plan is for the stream once it starts. It'll look just like a YouTube video is playing, and then when it ends, they'll go back to just a paused screen until your stream actually starts. Okay, that's it for the customization tab. Let's move on to visibility. Now this one, again, this is super important. Of course, you can make a private live stream and it works just like a private video where only you or people you add it to will be able to actually see it. Unlisted means that anybody with the link can watch it or anybody who found it through a playlist if you've added it to a playlist. If your channel has memberships, you can choose the members only tab and that means that only your members will be able to actually watch it. But of course, public is the one where that's going to blast it out to all your subscribers, gonna send them notifications if they've got the bell turned on, probably, not always, and it will also show up on people's home pages on YouTube when they just open youtube.com. The schedule here is gonna tell people when you're going live. Now this is really, really important to remember. This is just cosmetic. This does not actually do anything. This just puts a date on your stream. It's not gonna automatically start. It's not gonna stop you from starting early. It's not gonna stop you from starting late. It is just going to put that date on YouTube. If you schedule a stream and then don't start pushing video to YouTube, YouTube won't just start playing nothing. It'll just still say it's scheduled for 10 minutes ago. It's really easy to make this mistake and think that it's gonna auto start, but it it's not. It's just going to put the date on YouTube. I'm gonna go ahead and make a private video here for testing. And I'm gonna schedule this for a few minutes from now. As soon as you click done, if you've made it public, it'll start pushing out notifications to people that you've scheduled a live stream. Mine is private, so it's not gonna do that, but it will show up in the console here so we can test it out. Okay, so this is what the YouTube console looks like once a stream is scheduled. 
Up in the corner is the share button. You can actually click this link to see what it looks like on the main YouTube viewer page. Again, we've got just the thumbnail here and it is counting down the time to the start. And again, really important. This is not going to do anything when this timer runs out. It's just gonna sit here and say that it's scheduled for 5.30. Your viewers can click the notify me button and this will actually send a notification to them shortly before the scheduled time. All notifications on YouTube are not actually a guarantee. They're best effort and some people may not get notifications, but I found that the notification icon on the actual live stream itself, not on the channel, those tend to be the most reliable. Okay, back to the console. The next most important thing is stream key. The stream key is of course how you're gonna push video from a streaming encoder into YouTube. You'll probably have a default stream key already and if you've used other software or other different kinds of devices to stream to YouTube, you may also have a whole bunch more things in here as well. You can also just go ahead and make a new stream key if you want as well. This can help keep things organized like if you wanna give a unique stream key to each of your streaming encoders so you know which one you're streaming from or you can use it to put into software like Ecamm or even give it to a third party like somebody else who's gonna stream to your channel. When you do create a stream key, you get a couple of options. One is to choose the streaming protocol and the other is to choose the stream resolution. The default is RTMP and that's just kind of like the normal streaming right now. The other option is HLS and they call it advanced because there isn't that much software that can actually do this right now. You probably want to do RTMP, it'll be fine. Stream resolution, you can turn on manual settings if you want, but YouTube will automatically detect the stream resolution if you don't choose that. So here is where you can choose what kind of stream you're pushing. And this also tells you the target bit rates to aim for. So if you're streaming from an A10 mini, you would choose 1080p. And then you would set your target bit rate to somewhere between three and six megabits. You can turn on the 60 frames per second option, which if you're doing gaming or something that might be important, otherwise I wouldn't even bother. So let's give us a name. Let's just call it test, create the stream key. And now this is using this stream key. Another common misconception I hear is that you can only have one active live stream at a time. And that's actually not true. You can have multiple streams live simultaneously on your one channel. They just have to be using different stream keys. And that's one reason you might want to create multiple stream keys is so that you can have multiple live streams going at a time. One other note about stream keys is that this can't actually conflict with the stream key that you've got set up for the go now, go live button in the stream tab. We're gonna to get to this screen a little bit later, but if you do see an error, that's gonna be why. So for example, I've chosen the same stream key here that I have for the scheduled event. And now it says duplicate stream key, select a new key below to go live here. Otherwise it's gonna want to stream it to the scheduled event. So I like to just have this one set to one that I just call scratch so that I don't accidentally go live now. Let's go ahead and go back to the schedule live under the manage tab. So I'm sure you know this already, but of course you would go ahead and copy this stream key here, paste it into your streaming encoder and then start pushing data up to YouTube. You can actually reset the key in case you showed it on a live stream accidentally or intentionally. And this will reset the stream key, but keep all the other settings you've got up here. I'm gonna come back to the stream URL and backup URL in a second, but let's talk about stream latency really quick. One thing to note here is that this is not an exact science. This is rough guidance about what's gonna happen, but more importantly, it actually affects a couple of the other features. It'll default you to normal latency, which is going to be about 30 seconds. It can be sometimes down to 20, Again, it's not an exact science, but you can expect a significant delay between what you're streaming and what your viewers see. One of the nice things about normal latency is that this is gonna be the most forgiving if you have a bad internet connection and you have a couple of hiccups. Because it has that 30 second buffer, if there's a short gap and then it can catch up, the viewers won't actually see any gaps. The low latency option is a pretty good option. This does support 4K, and this will drop the latency down to, I don't know, about 10 seconds or so. Again, not an exact science, maybe different for you once you actually start using it. But the low and ultra low latency will not let you actually use closed captions at all. And that takes us to the ultra low latency option. This does not support closed captions or 1440p or 4K resolutions. So basically it's 1080 only. The nice thing about ultra low latency is that it is really ultra low. It's like two or three seconds. And this is actually really useful if you wanna have a super interactive live stream where your viewers are able to chat with you and you can see what they're saying and respond to them immediately. With a 30 second delay, what ends up happening is that you say something like, hey, how's it going? Let me know where you're joining from. And then it takes 30 seconds before they hear that, which means you've got a 30 second gap of content to fill with something. And you have to make something up while you're waiting for responses to pour in. And then you'll see responses pour in. So I like having an ultra low because basically as soon as I say something, two seconds later, they hear it and they can respond. 
and then we can have a really quick back and forth. So if highly interactive live streams are important to you, definitely do ultra low latency. You just won't be able to stream in 4K and you won't get closed captions. If you want to support closed captions, either from automatic captions from YouTube generated or from an actual person typing on a keyboard, choose normal latency. And that'll actually let you then turn on closed captions. I'm going to leave mine on ultra low for now, since that's what I usually live stream in. Now let's go over here to the additional settings. There's a couple of really important options here as well. Enable auto start being one of them. Now, auto start is not going to auto start at the scheduled time. It's going to auto start the stream as soon as YouTube starts getting streaming data to that stream key. So if we turn this on, then as soon as you hit go live on your A10 mini, it'll start pushing to YouTube and YouTube will start the stream. Be very, very careful with this, especially if you have multiple people who access the account or if you regularly use multiple different stream keys. It can be very easy to accidentally just go live accidentally when you are using some other streaming encoder that you're testing out in your studio. And again, this auto start feature versus the scheduled live stream, it's kind of confusing at first because you would think that it like the auto start means start at the scheduled time, but no, it's actually gonna start as soon as it gets streaming data to that stream key, regardless of the scheduled time. Okay, auto stop, this is the opposite. If you turn on auto stop, then it's going to actually end the stream when YouTube stops getting data to that stream key. It does take a couple of seconds for it to register. It's not just like immediate. So if you turn this on, then you can just end the stream when you hit off air on your ATEM. So there's a problem with this option, both using it and not using it. If you are using auto stop and you have a glitch with your network connection that's long enough, it can cause your stream to actually end. And the bad news about that is that once a YouTube stream ends, there's no way to get it back. There's there's no restart. What that means for your viewers is if they're on your live stream with this URL and they're watching you go live and then the stream ends because you had auto stop turned off, they'll have to go to a new URL in order to get back to your live. So if you have an accident and your network connection drops long enough, it'll end the stream and you're gonna have a heck of a time getting everybody back to figure out how to get them to the right new URL. However, not using auto stop has an interesting, similar problem. If you don't turn on auto stop and then you stop sending data to the streaming console, YouTube will think that you're gonna still send data later. So if I'm doing a live stream, I'm done, I hit stop on my A10 mini, YouTube is gonna say, okay, well, I'm not gonna end the stream. We're gonna just you know keep it open in case he starts sending more data again. And it'll stay open for a very, very long time, which has a couple of interesting implications. One, it'll still be bubbled up to people's home pages as if you were live. They're gonna click it and they'll get scrolled back to about like 15 seconds before or so, and then they'll get to the end and then it'll just be nothing, it'll just start spinning. And if people are on your channel page, it'll say that you're still live. It'll say live, you'll have a little live icon next to your channel name over here, and people are gonna think that you're still live even though you've ended the stream. In order to actually end the stream, you have to click the end stream button that's gonna appear in the corner once we actually go live. At some point, YouTube will give up and it'll actually close it, but I think it's like around 12 hours or so that it'll wait. So my recommendation is that you do not turn on auto start or auto stop, and you actually start and stop the stream manually. With those off, you get a go live button in the corner, and this will turn into a off air or stop streaming once you're live. Okay, back to additional settings. Enable DVR is the next checkbox. This is what lets people scroll back while you're live or watch the replay, both things together. So if you turn off DVR, it means that when you're live, you're live, people cannot rewind and all they can see is what's current. It also means when your live stream is done, there will not be a replay to watch. I like having all my live streams archived, so I always leave this on. The 360 video option, turn this on if you're gonna be streaming 360 video from a 360 camera. It's probably not very normal, but what this basically does is it turns the YouTube player into a 360 viewer where people can actually scroll and like pan around the room as if they were there. It's kind of cool, but of course you need to be setting it 360 video, otherwise it's not gonna make any sense. This added delay feature, this is if you want it to add more delay on top of the built-in delay of your stream latency. So we've got the normal latency over here. This is about 30 seconds. You can add another 30 seconds to that if you want, or even a minute. So if you're at ultra low, but then you wanna add more latency, I don't know why you'd wanna do that, but you can. Uh, one weird thing though, is that there's no like, you don't get any other controls here. It's just gonna go back in time. You don't get the ability to like bleep out things before they actually get broadcast. You can't like 
undo once you're streaming. You can't like you know pause the stream or take out a gap. It's just adding a delay. Oh, turns out you actually can't choose add a delay and ultra low latency, which makes sense. So I'm gonna leave that off. Okay, we mentioned closed captions a minute ago relating to stream latency. I can't turn closed captions on with ultra low latency. I actually have to go to normal latency in order to use closed captions. So with closed captions turned on, there's three ways this can work. Automatic captions uses YouTube's own AI to transcribe your video as you're speaking, which is I guess why it needs that 30 second buffer. It'll do a decent job. It's kind of like the auto captions that you get on the videos. It's definitely not perfect. There's definitely mistakes in there and uh, you know, jargon or acronyms don't always work, but it is better than nothing. If you want actually good captions, you can use an actual person typing at a keyboard live, and then they have software that can push those captions to YouTube. Post captions to a URL. So this will actually give a URL for people who are using this kind of software. You can share this with them and then their software posts these captions to this URL. That'll be a stenographer's software that they are gonna plug into their fancy keyboard with all the fun keys on it. And then they can transcribe your videos in real time. And they'll do a much better job than YouTube's auto captioning. If your live stream software itself embeds captions in the video stream, you can choose this option. And this is gonna only work with certain video streaming encoders. So not the A10 mini, there's no way to add captions there, but some streaming encoders can embed captions into the stream. And that could be from some sonographer who's actually typing manually, or it could also be an AI caption generator. Okay, the last option here, unlist live replay once stream ends. If you turn this on, basically what it means is that once the live stream is ended, it will turn into an unlisted video. So again, if it's in a playlist, it'll still be findable, but if it's not in a playlist, the only people who can find it are people who have already seen it and bookmarked it or something like that. I like to have mine public, but not everybody does like their archives of streams public. So you can use this to automatically unlist it as soon as your stream is over. All right, so that covers the features here. Let's actually start a live stream. That way we can actually see some of these in action. Most of these settings you can't change once you're live. So make sure you get it right before you start sending data. I'm gonna go ahead and choose my web presenter stream key because that's what I've got in the web presenter here. And now I can start streaming to it from the web presenter in my studio. Go ahead and turn that on. And in a couple of seconds, you should see this turn into receiving data. Excellent connection, great. Couple weird things are going on here. So notice how there's no go live button yet. There's no preview, but it does have a green light. YouTube is just very inconsistent. There's not a lot you can do about it. Sometimes it doesn't register and you have to refresh the page or start streaming again, and it's kind of annoying. If you don't have auto start on, then the only way to start the stream is after this big blue button in the corner lights up. And it's only gonna light up once you're pushing data to that stream key. If your computer itself has a flaky network connection, like you're out in the field somewhere, or you're trying to do this on your phone, don't even try to do it on your phone, uh, you may end up in a situation where you see a preview, you see an excellent connection, but it's not turning blue. And that's just a problem with YouTube. And there's not a lot you can do except just refresh and try again. So if you do, if you are in that situation, just reload the page and then it will hopefully register that there's data coming to that stream URL and it'll give you the go live option. Because we're not actually live yet, I can still change these options. But once I go live, these are all gonna become fixed and locked in. Let's go ahead and go live. I am going to a private URL, so it's not blasting this out to everybody on my channel right now. It's gonna take a couple seconds and now we're live. Speaking of taking a couple seconds before you're live, this is one of the reasons that you should never actually go live with a camera angle pointed at your face because you can't actually tell when you're actually live on your channel. I have a separate video that talks all about how to use countdown timers to introduce yourself into your live stream in a way that you can control. I'll leave that link down below and up there. So now you're live, you're streaming to your channel, one other interesting note about going live is that sometimes if somebody has this tab open, then they actually won't automatically start seeing it playing. And it's again, kind of just a problem with YouTube. So they may need to actually refresh their page in order to see it start working, which is kind of annoying. You can see the captions are working. That's pretty cool. Okay, so now you're live and your viewers are watching your stream. That's great. Let's talk about some of the other things, other tabs here in the console. Analytics is gonna tell you a graph of concurrent viewers who are watching your stream. This is really useful so you get a sense of how many people are actually watching you live. It will update. It's not right now because there's only one person watching and it's just me, so I think it doesn't register it. But it'll start showing you a little graph over time of how many people are tuned in now. Viewer activity is gonna show you uh, live chat and uh, super chats for a stream that is not private, I guess. If I go over to my scheduled live stream, 
and click viewer activity. It says there's no Super Chats members yet. So if you have memberships turned on, you'll see new members show up in here and Super Chats will show up in here as well. Okay, let's talk about the Stream Health tab. This one is weird. The goal of this is that YouTube is trying to give you feedback on the health of the data that you're sending to YouTube. So it's going to say stream is healthy if everything's fine. It'll also it also might give you errors like the bitrate is too low or too high or it's missing audio or things like that. There's a whole bunch of different errors that might show up here. The problem is that it's not always actually accurate. Sometimes there are no problems and it just gives you a random error message. Sometimes there's lots of problems and it says everything's fine. So you can't always take it at face value. Don't read into it too much. Uh, one other thing to note is that YouTube does want fixed bitrate streams. So the target range for 1080p is three to six megabits. It doesn't like when the bitrate drops below that. So when I'm streaming a camera angle of myself or any video feed, it's gonna be about six megabits. And the web presenter is a variable bitrate encoder, which means it'll use as little as possible to get the information across. So you can see on the status here, it's encoding this shot at about six megabits, which is good. YouTube's happy with that. However, if I change to a screen like this, where it's now mostly not changing parts of the image and there's only a small amount of video, notice how the data rate in the web presenter has dropped because it doesn't need to use six megabits to encode this picture. Now, YouTube actually doesn't like when the bitrate is this low. It's not gonna complain because it's still, I think, close enough to three. But if I switch it over to just a static shot of my computer screen, this is gonna drop the bitrate even further and we might now start seeing problems on YouTube. But again, YouTube is kind of slow to react sometimes and it's not always entirely obvious that there is a problem or that YouTube might incorrectly report that there is or is not a problem. I'm gonna go ahead and wait a little bit to see if it actually kicks in. Okay, finally it kicked in and it says, the stream's current bitrate, 843 kilobits a second, is lower than the recommended. So now we got a warning here. And if I switch back to my camera, we should see the bitrate go up in the web presenter and then YouTube should clear out this error message. One of the weird things though, is that if you're sending a bitrate that is way higher, it might still say that you're not sending enough, which doesn't really make sense. Like it'll say you're sending your bitrate of 20 megabits is lower than the target of four and a half, which is not true, but that's just YouTube for you. So again, it takes a while for this to kick in, but you'll see in a second, hopefully that it should say the stream is healthy again. Okay, well, I've been at six megabits for like a minute now, and it still says that there's a warning and the bit rate's too low. So just an example of how this is not an entirely reliable reporting system here. Okay. Last tab here, shopping. The shopping tab is relatively new. It's not available to everybody yet. Uh, this lets you actually highlight products in the chat section during your live stream. The weird thing is that right now you can apparently only choose products that are in your own store, not products that are like on the public catalog. So I can't just search A10 mini. It says no results found because I don't have any A10 minis for sale in my own store. I think they're still working on this. It's in beta right now. I'm sure that'll get fixed later. Uh, but that's the their intro into the live shopping world. So let's get out of that. The last ones I wanted to talk about here were the stream URL and backup server URL. This lets you do a couple of cool things. So the idea is a stream URL is what you should be normally pushing video to with that stream key. And to actually make a URL for some software, you take this and then you put a slash and then you add the stream key onto the end. Some streaming encoders want the URL in that format. Normally you should send data to the first primary stream URL. It also gives you a backup server URL, which you can push to with the same stream key. Really important note, only push one video feed to each URL and stream key. Otherwise really unpredictable things happen. Okay, stream URL, primary server URL, backup URL. If you have two different feeds going to two different, the two different URLs, then YouTube will use the backup server URL if the first one fails. The way this works is not entirely obvious, and it's also not the way I would want it to work. What happens is if the video feed from the primary stream URL goes away, drops, YouTube will automatically fail over to showing what's at the backup URL. So if you have two separate encoders with the same video feed streaming, your viewers will probably not notice much of a glitch. It might spin for a half second while YouTube switches over and then they'll see the content from the other encoder. That's useful. However, it will not switch back automatically if the primary URL comes back online. So in a situation where in a live event, when you have your primary encoder die for some reason and you're on the backup, 
the only way to go back to the primary is to start streaming to the primary URL and then kill the backup encoder, stop that, and then it will fail back. So it's only ever going to automatically switch when one fails. It'll automatically switch over to the other stream. And that's in both directions, primary to backup and backup to primary. And really annoyingly, there is no way to tell which of the two is actually active on YouTube. There is no indication in the console about which of the two URLs is actually receiving data. It would be very nice if they had that option and also maybe an option to manually switch over so that I can keep the backup encoder running, force it back to the primary URL and leave my backup as a backup. Feature request for YouTube in case they happen to be listening. One of the things you can do with this is if you don't actually have two encoders for the event you're at, you could actually push a off air or technical difficulties graphic from a computer or another encoder at your studio. So let's say I'm out at a gig, I have my portable encoder on site, and then I, in my studio, I leave a off air or technical difficulties graphic streaming to the backup URL. Then if my primary URL goes down at the event, people won't see the stream paused, they'll see a graphic. Now, of course, in order to flip it back to the primary, I have to actually stop the backup encoder, but you can work that out with uh, remote access to your studio in case that actually happens. One little trick to try, I have done it before. Uh, it can just sometimes make more complications than you actually need though. But at the very least, it's a good way to stream two different copies for redundancy. One other thing I would recommend about that is if you are using two encoders for a job, use two totally different kinds of encoders. Don't just use like two A10 minis or two YOLO boxes. Use an A10 mini on the primary, use a YOLO box to this backup. And the reason for that is that different encoders actually handle failures in the network in totally different ways. I have another recent video I just did about the new network bonding feature in the YOLO box. I'll link that down below. But one of the things I did in that video was I tested what happens when you just pull out the ethernet cord or turn off the Wi-Fi on the YOLO box, or if both connections start having massive packet loss. And I wanted to see what the YOLO box could recover from. And it turns out with the new network bonding feature, it's really good at recovering from pretty bad network conditions. And that is actually not at all true with the A10 mini. I'm going to do another video demonstrating the same kinds of network glitches with the A10 mini, and you'll see just how poorly it deals with bad network conditions. So it is really useful to have two different kinds of encoders. That way you don't have the same problems with both. I promised we were going to get back to this stream now tab. Let's go ahead and talk about that. First, I'm going to have to obviously stop this live stream. So we're going to go ahead and end this stream. This will actually close out this video. It'll turn into a DVR playback only, and I will not be able to push video to this same URL again. Now over to the stream tab. The stream tab is kind of like a shortcut for scheduled live streams. They are not scheduled and they will always go live, auto start and auto stop. So notice that the settings that are visible down here are everything that you saw before, but no setting for auto start, auto stop. That's because it just will do that. That's the point of this tab. So what you can do is you can actually use a stream key as your go live now. There is no scheduled stream in this tab, which means there's no way for someone to know ahead of time that there is going to be a stream. Normally, if you're looking at your channel page, it'll show your upcoming live streams if you've got that block turned on in your channel editor. With the go live now tab, the stream tab, there's not going to be a placeholder ahead of time so people won't know ahead of time that you're planning to go live. That's what it's for. It's for on the fly going live. So. The really important thing here to remember is that whatever your defaults are here are going to apply to the automatically created video. As soon as it starts getting data to that stream key, it's going to make a new video on your channel with these settings. So I've got this one called test stream, just testing something. And really importantly, the visibility here is unlisted. So if you have it public, as soon as I start pushing video to the stream key, it's going to start blasting out notifications to all my followers and it'll show up on my channel. I'm not going to do that right now because that'll cause chaos, but I can push to an unlisted video as long as it's not in a playlist. If you put it in a playlist, then people can find it again. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. Click save. Um, all these other settings are the settings that are going to appear in the new video that gets created when this when I go live. You choose your stream key that you want to use for the go live now. I am currently still pushing video to that web presenter stream key because that's what I was using for that other stream. So if I choose this now, it'll start, it should just go live. Oh, because that is actually scheduled for my actual stream. Let's use a different stream key. 
Let's go ahead and do test. And then I'm gonna go ahead and actually copy and paste this into my web presenter. So I've got this scratch stream key. I'm gonna delete this as soon as I've done recording. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna paste this in to the web presenter and then go on air. And as soon as I'm streaming, we should see video show up here in a second. Now we're live. And as soon as I did that, now this video exists. Now it has a URL. It didn't have a URL before because it wasn't created yet. So now I can click on this and see the stream live unlisted with the default description and default title that I put in that editor. Everything else here now works the same way as if it's a regular video. And you can see that my URL up here actually changed to include the video ID. You do get the option of ending the stream automatically from the console with the end stream button. But also if I just stop sending data from the web presenter, it will eventually auto stop and shut off that video. I press stop, we should see it go away here in a second as soon as it registers that it doesn't have any more data, no data, the stream will end shortly unless you restart it in your streaming software. That is very helpful. And I don't remember how long it takes before it actually stops. We'll find out in a second. There we go, now it ended. That was about 30 to 45 seconds after I stopped sending data from the encoder, then the stream automatically stopped and it shows you this little splash screen with a summary of the stream. And now that that stream is done, we're back to this go live now page where we can change the settings and do it all again. So one thing I noticed while recording this that I actually didn't remember is that I actually kind of misspoke about the go live feature at the beginning. When we're looking at this stream now tab, where it's just going to auto create the video, it actually does kind of automatically create the video before you go live. And there's no way to find it from as like a member of the public, like as a viewer, it's not going to show up in upcoming because it's not actually scheduled. And it's not gonna show up in your videos tab either. But if you look in your console, your YouTube console and look in the URL, there actually is a video ID up here and the share button works. So if you click share, you get this pop-up with a URL to the video that is going to get video when you start pushing, but doesn't exist yet. And if you click on it, it actually does take you to a video page, which means this is the URL I could share to someone and, and this will be the video URL the next time I use this go live now feature. This is definitely not the most reliable way to send scheduled live stream links to people, but it would work. So I can send this to somebody now and say, hey, I'm gonna go live in a second. Here's the link, even though I'm not sending data yet. And then I can actually push video from my streaming encoder and then it's gonna show up in this page. Let's give this a try really quick. Pushing data from my stream, my web presenter over here, it says excellent connection, we are live. And back over here, it started auto playing at that same URL. So we all learned something today, myself included. Speaking of which, you should join my live streams if you like to see this kind of stuff because I try this stuff out live, I mess things up, I press all the buttons until something breaks and chat with everybody while it's all happening. So join my live streams, 10 a.m. Sundays. It's a great time. Say hi to people in the chat and talk about live streaming and ATEMs and YOLO boxes. I hope you learned something from this video. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comments. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Oh no. Oh no. I actually went live while I was recording this and we've got people in the chat and end the stream. We'll see who mentions that during my next live stream. All right.